We will begin uh, with Sri Amonkar reading out a few lines from his translation of Krishna Purana. He will first read the verses in Marathi and then read the Konkani translation. Krishna Purana, Pailne Purana Parmeshwara Swamiya Va Santa Mahanta Chi Stuti Ani Samagra Grantha Chi Sasari Tika Paila Abhaswaru O Namo Vishwa Bharita Deva Bhapa Sarva Samaratha Parmeshwara Satyabanta Svarga Prithvicha Rasanara Tu Rili Siddhita Dataru Kripa Nidhi Karuna Karu Tu Sarva Sukhata Sagharu Adi Antu Natore Tu Paramanandu Sarva Svarupu Vishwa Vyapaku Gnana Deepu Tu Sarva Guni Nirlepu Nirmalu Nirvikaru Swamiya Tu Adrushtu Tu Avyaktu Samadayaru Sarva Praptu Sarva Gnanu Sarva Nitivantu Ekuti Devutu Tu Sakyat Parmeshwaru Anadi Sidhu Aparamparu Adi Anadi Avinasu Amaru Tuja Stavanatri Loki. Now I'll read the Kokni version. Paila Puran Parmeshwara Swamaki Ani Santa Mahantaji Stuti Ani Purai Grantaji Samoshana Sangili Tika Paila Avaswaru. O Namo Vishwabharita Deva Bapa Samartha Parmeshwara Satyabanta Sarga Prithvicha Rasanara Tu Riddhi Siddhi Cha Dataru Kurpe Nidhi Cha Karunakaru Tu Sarva Sukha Cha Sagaru Tu Anadi Ananta Gavana Tu Palamanandu Sarva Swarupu Vishwabhyap Ginana Deepu, Sarva Guna Pasunu Nirlepu, Nirmaru Nirvikaru Swamya, Tu Adrushtu, Tu Avyaktu, Samadayaru, Sarva Shakti Vantu, Sarva Ginyani, Sarva Niti Vantu, Ekuchi Devu, Tu Sakshat Parmeshwaru, Anadi Siddha Aparamparu, Adi Anadi Abhinashi, Amaru. You have had a long and illustrious career in education, in literature, in translation. Uh, you have been very recently appointed the chairman of the Konkani, Goa, Konkani. Goa, Goa Konkani Academy. Uh, so could you give us a small introduction about your work so far, about your translation work, a brief summary of your life and work? Well, uh, interestingly, uh, I had a very long career in the field of education and uh, uh, when I did my graduation and uh, my teacher's training uh, degree in Pune way back in 1956, my first stint was uh, uh, teaching in uh, uh, Kenya, East Africa, where I went and taught in the what is uh, uh, then known as Gohan High School, now Sacred Heart of Jesus School in Mombasa, Kenya. And uh, after that, actually, mm, I had got uh, almost admission to the London School of Economics in for the term of 19, August 1961. But my father, who was running the school here, uh, had his uh, heart attack, was not keeping good health. And I had to take a decision. I think, you know, uh, destiny, uh, shapes our life. Uh, I, I more and more I believe in that, and that uh, his illness brought back, back me to Goa, just a year before Goa was, was liberated from the Portuguese, and then I was busy with my educational career and uh, managing the school. I was busy with the Goa Headmasters Association as the first secretary and later the president, and uh, numerous other. Uh, social activities such as uh, the Junior Red Cross and uh, I was writing, I was a correspondent for the local uh, press, a local newspaper called the Navin Times which was, which was launched after the liberation of Goa and uh, 
numerous other activities, literary uh, and uh, social. And uh, my reading was going on. I was I'm rest- interested in, uh, uh, both in English in literature, both English and local regional uh, languages, Marathi and Kokni. But uh, I was also interested in history, both the world history as well as history of uh, Goa. Coincidentally, uh, when I'd gone to Bombay once in 1993, I uh, saw one book in the Fort Bombay uh, footpath. There, there are a lot of books there, bookstores there. It was Dhammapada in Pali and English. Uh, because of my knowledge of Sanskrit, I could uh, see, read that Pali version. It was in Devanagari script. And uh, the English translation. And somehow I said, well, because I'm a lover of Buddha. Okay. You see, I call myself a Hindu Buddhist. So, uh, uh, I was telling you that it is only uh, about a couple of years before I retired that I came across that, uh, I found uh, that book. And that changed my life because uh, I uh, decided to translate that book for which I studied the Pali language. I bought the books and the Pali dictionary, uh, and uh, about a year and a half I studied the Pali language, and I was able to translate it, original Pali, into uh, Kokni uh, prose and verse, the same meter, same shanda. That book uh, uh, was a very successful translation because uh, uh, the great uh, Ravinder Kaleka, the Nanprit Awardee, of Kokni literature, uh, said that this was a wonderful text that I had translated and I should publish it. So I said I agreed because I had done 28 revisions of Dhammapada. 28? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, he was impressed with it. Uh, he said just as the uh, style of English language is in, uh, has been established by uh, the first translation of the English Bible, mm-hmm. the James authorized version, yeah, in the same way, uh, this book will uh, establish the uh, style of Konkli language in the future. Mm-hmm. That was published, and apparently it was published by Asmitai Pratishtan. Mm-hmm. The first, my first book that was published by an outside uh, you know, publication uh, firm, because I later found my own uh, publication firm called Gita Prasad, and mm-hmm. all my books have been done by published by Gita Prasad. And luckily enough, that book was awarded the translation award by the Saita Academy. Okay. So it was, uh, uh, from that point of view, uh, Dhammapada was uh, very lucky for me. And then it started, one after the other. I started with uh, 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 Dhammapada, and that was the beginning of the number of books I planned, because I said my language, Kokni, has to be strengthened. And the best way to strengthen the language is to bring the best of classics into uh, Kokni. And I started uh, immediately with uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita. Literally it took five and a half years to translate those 701 verses. That was, a, I think, a big uh, contribution to Kokni language. And then I took up uh, Nyaneshwari, which is a commentary again on Bhagavad Gita, done by Santa Nyaneshwar. 9,300 verses, again another five years, because my work schedule is Monday through Friday, uh, to Sunday, without a break, six to seven hours a day. So that's why I'm, I'm able to do this work. Totally focused, no other breaks. So each of my uh, translation work is almost like a PhD thesis because I do a lot of uh, you know other My historical family. background work and put it in the book. So I'm happy that uh, I'm contributing to this to knowledge. Okay. That is exactly the purpose of doing PhD thesis. Yes. What are you contributing to the funda of knowledge? Yes. That is what the PhD thesis is all about. So the Krista Purana is a is a massive text. It has yeah. 10,962 yeah, verses. Yeah, almost uh, 11,000. Yes, almost 11,000. So, uh, why did you choose Krista Purana for translation? When did you start 
the translation of Krishna Purana. You know, Christianity has a, uh, always interested me. And because uh, uh, the, the Portuguese brought Christianity here, though Christianity had come to India uh, uh, years, centuries ago, uh, yeah, with the arrival of um, St. Thomas in, in, uh, uh, in, in Chennai, uh, and then later on with the Syrian Christians in Kerala. But the, Christ, uh, the Portuguese brought their brand of Roman Catholicism. And more than uh, giving uh, uh, the message of Christ to the people of Goa, and the western coast, I felt the Portuguese wanted to create uh, uh, Indians in their own image, Portuguese image. They want to, wanted to uh, westernize them, they wanted to make them suited and booted, and, uh, and they won't, didn't really uh, believe in, uh, in uh, local languages. But the thinkers among them realized that unless uh, Christianity was brought to the people through the local languages, Christianity won't develop roots in the country. And so the person who took up this challenge, this challenge of uh, translating uh, the Old and the New Testament, was not uh, done by any of the Spanish and the Portuguese Jesuits or Italian Jesuits. It was, the challenge was taken by an Englishman called Thomas Stevens, known in Portu Portuguese uh, as Thomas Estebao. This man was himself a persecuted Christian in England. He fled England to avoid persecution. He went to San Andre Seminary in Rome, I think way back in uh, 1556. Uh, uh, in 1579, he, yeah, even before his ordination, I'm sorry, you see, he was born in 1546. 49. Uh, 49. And then he went to, um, uh, to Rome and uh, he landed in Goa in 1579. And he was ordained as a priest in Goa. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, not there. Then what, because he was a zealous uh, missionary, he had heard that the Portuguese had already reached the East. He wanted to spread the message of Christ to the Indians. And he said that he doesn't mind even being martyred for this cause. He, uh, he went to Lisbon, one ship was leaving and he boarded that ship. And after a long voyage of um, almost three or four months, he arrived in Goa. Uh, and uh, he was fired by the, that missionary zeal. And uh, he studied the local languages. He knew uh, the local scripts, Devanagari. And perhaps he also wanted the script is to be translate, uh, transliterated in the local script. But he could not do it because the Portuguese uh, who had tried to uh, do the funds in Devanagari, the, the technicians, uh, both of them died. So he was forced to use the Roman script for his work. And what a great work it is. He has done it in the Oval Meter. And uh, uh, this is uh, the first part is uh, dealing with uh, the Old Testament and the prophecies made uh, about the coming of uh, Jesus, coming of Christ, the Anointed One. And uh, the second uh, part deals with the, uh, the 
teachings of Jesus. Beautifully done, and I enjoyed uh, my almost. I did. It took about two and a half, two two years to translate these eleven thousand verses, and I could do it, you know, with ease because uh, the OV meter is an easier meter. Three lines first the quatrains, shlokas. Mm -hmm. uh, three lines of, are uh, are rhymed. The fourth one uh, uh, is a shorter one, but of course. Uh, the in Naneshwari, uh, Naneshwar has the has really compressed the fourth line, whereas uh, Stephens's line is a bit longer. Perhaps he didn't have the that that much of control over the language, but I have tried to make it shorter in my Kokni version because I'll just show you uh, uh, the uh, rhyme uh, uh, the rhyme lines. Tu Parmanandu Sarva Swarupu Vishwa Vyapi Ginanu Dipu Swarupu Dipu Sarva Guna Pasunu Nirlepu So three, three lines mm -hmm. huh? Swarupu Dipu Nirlepu and the fourth one is Nirmalu Nirvikaru Swamya The fourth line is a shorter one but not rhymed with the other three words. So, uh, uh, because of my background, uh, because I'm, uh, I believe in dialogue, religious dialogue, and I feel that uh, all religions are trying to, uh, the world over, are trying to humanize people. That is the purpose of the religion. We have to be, become better human beings. We have to build a better human society. And, uh, well, love and compassion and forgiveness that Jesus preached is, uh, uh, can be followed by anybody. You don't have to be baptized for it. Some, somebody told me once, in fact, one bishop said, some, somebody introduced me as a, as a student of, uh, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So uh, he turned around later on and just said, Oh, uh, Mr. Amonkar cannot be called. Uh, disciple of Jesus because he's not baptized. I said, Your Grace? I said, I'll be very happy to be baptized, provided John the Baptist does the job for me. <laughs> and actually that floored him and everybody came around and said afterwards, after he went away, Oh, Mr. Amunka, you gave a fitting re reply to him. Because uh, for me, I've been greatly influenced by, by Jesus, particularly his compassion and his forgiveness. Because to Say, Father, forgive them when you are being tortured yes. on the cross. It's not a joke. Not. See how, uh, through all the pain and the passion that he went through, mm. he <coughs> was prepared to forgive. Mm. That was his greatness. Mm. And I think that is what each, each person in this world has to do if we want to create a better world based on love and understanding. Clearly you found the Krishna Purana to be a text of uh, some literary beauty yeah. and you thought it would be worth translating yeah. into Konkani. Uh, <coughs> what place do you think this text holds in the Goan cultural landscape, yeah. in, in the cultural landscape of Goa yeah. uh, or in the linguistic history of Goa or the literary history of Goa? Do you think that this text has some place? Do you think it deserves a place even today? No doubt, it's a great epic work. It does deserve a place, does deserve a place, but unfortunately today, the people for whom it was done just cannot read it. Because the Catholics of Goa, by and large, the younger generation today is being educated through the English media. They don't study Marathi. They have been alienated and cut off from Marathi because the Catholics by and large feel that Marathi is not their language. Kokani is their language. And this book was done in Marathi. But Stephen himself says in his preface, He Sarva Marathi Bhasena Lille Hai. All this is written in Marathi. But, Sudha Marathi Madhima Lokasi Nakale Dekhundu. Because, uh, 
literary high flown marathi suda marathi pure marathi is not uh, understood by the common folk common people ek uh, sope brahmani bhase ki utare misarit karunu kavitva sope ke le i have used it is called it a kokle language he calls it a language spoken by the brahmins because he learnt it from the converted brahmins mm. of goa ek sope bhase brahmani bhase thi utare words of uh, language spoken by the brahmins i used them in my uh, text and made the poetry easy for people to understand so he has made it very clear but unfortunately uh, in 1684 after uh, three or four generations of catholics read and understood this book the book itself was withdrawn by the portuguese by francis uh, by sir francis the tavra and he put an order that everybody within a period of three years will learn portuguese and everybody should stop talking in kokli and marathi because kokli was a spoken language of course they failed miserably but the catholics lost touch with marathi because they couldn't they were separated totally very few people today uh, go in for marathi medium education primary education 98% of the catholics go in for english medium so how can they understand the great thomas stevens and krishna purana mm. so that is why i have brought this in konkani that was one reason mm. we know that this is <coughs> one of the first texts printed uh, in uh, the press in goa one of the earliest printed texts of india or south asia we can say uh, <coughs> but we do have some handwritten manuscripts available yeah. uh, and there are modern editions yeah and translations by scholars like Nelson Falcao uh, your recent konkani yeah. translation of course uh, but for your translation what manuscripts did you refer to or what did you use as your source text uh, i used uh, for my source text two versions one was uh, uh, joseph saldana yes. text published in 1900 at mangalore and you will be surprised that the uh, the goans even after they were converted were being persecuted because they were not becoming portuguese they were not following portuguese customs they were though they were converted they were still carrying on the indian ways they were celebrating shashti uh, and the birth rites were local they uh, they wanted uh, the wedding rites local uh, uh, ceremonies so they ran away with copies of manuscript copies of uh, krishna purana to mangalore and you'll be surprised to know that uh, many of the catholics uh, were, were captured by tipu sultan and taken out of mangalore area to shirangapatnam they took these copies with them to give them solace spiritual solace and uh, <clears throat> joseph taldana used these text to print his book in roman script in 1907 it is published published by uh, the college jesuit college in mangalore it is that book which is again a rare book the book uh, when i got it it was uh, you just folded it it was in tatters it just uh, tumbled yes 1907 book yes. uh, my student became uh, the bishop of sindhudurg okay. so i told uh, bishop alvin barreto i said i would like to have a copy of that book please okay. see okay and he managed to get me a copy okay. of krishna purana of 1907 copy published by edited by sardana so that was one uh, thing that i followed and i have handed that copy to the central library second test i followed was the devanagari transliteration 
by Professor Shantaram Bandel. How did you prepare for this translation? Or, uh, and in addition to that, if you could tell us what were the challenges that you faced, both linguistically and otherwise, while actually translating the verses, yeah. as you approached the verses closely, what were the challenges that you faced? You know, fortunately for me, it was not a difficult task because I was deeply steeped in the text itself and not only the text but the total aura that is around the text because uh, I have a feeling because I'm myself a man of faith I don't do any ritualistic uh, temple going but I uh, I don't know whether I, sh I should uh, use the word spiritual because spiritual has a di you know rather high status, but I think this you know ability to understand the message of the writer is important. Once you are in it, then and I have a feeling that I'm the chosen person. Tell you frankly, yes. that I have been chosen by the Almighty to do this work. Otherwise, I had not planned any of the scriptures, 10 or 12 scriptures I have done in the last 25 years of after my retirement. Why did it happen? But I'm not being paid for this work. So I don't think anybody can uh, uh, appoint XYZ to do this this work for some monetary benefit. There has to be a calling. It has, it has to be a calling. You have to be chosen and you have to feel that you are the chosen one. How many revisions did you do after you first translated? I did the translation but it was not a difficult thing for me because I felt I had done a good job uh, because the OV, OV meter is easier than other meters. Yes. It is more elastic. Yes. And so, uh, well, it just it was just flowing, you know, like poetry. Yes. I feel, felt uh, that uh, uh, I had totally identified myself with uh, uh, Stevens, mm -hmm. and perhaps who knows, Stevens uh, was working through me. Yes. You can never know that. You see. Yes. I have that feeling yes. that he perhaps he knows that he came all the way to India to propagate the message of Christ. But nobody is reading it, so he has chosen me and set on, set on me and got this work done. Yes. So I was a possessed one. <laughs> you brought out a 300 page, almost 300 page preface along with the translation. What was the need or reason for that? How did that come about? I have a feeling that unless we know our history, we can't understand ourselves as a people. And Indians, by and large, ignore history, ignore the past. We are not conscious of our history. We don't care for our history. And uh, because we don't bother about history, we perhaps commit the same mistakes over and over again. So I felt that uh, this great encounter had taken place. How did <coughs> we face the Portuguese? <coughs> Some people fled the land. <coughs> other people were converted and they could help it because that conversion was uh, accepted by them because the fact that they had their own lands, they had their properties, they had their families and so uh, because there were mass conversions. And forced conversions. Yeah. So uh, when those mass conversions take place, uh, the, well, it is more of a policy. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, in fact, a lot of people went <coughs> away from Goa. They lived in neighborhood areas. That those areas were not the islands. Portuguese called them terra fir firma, firm lands. Yeah. Huh? Terra, land, firma, firm. So they were uh, some ambassadors were sent to them uh, and said, you come 
and we'll give you your lands, only thing that you'll have to convert. And so they came back. And uh, they came out of necessity because uh, it's a matter of survival for them. And uh, as somebody had said, I quoted him, one uh, judge, that first we are converted and then we got the faith. So uh, this, this <coughs> prefatory volume, this book that has come out as a preface, is a result of your research yeah. that you did for your translation. Yeah. So uh, are there some other scholars who have contributed to this preface? Uh, are there essays by some other scholars? Yeah. Uh, Professor uh, Tadkorka, um, uh, the head of the department of Marathi, <coughs> he has written a preface to this. Yes. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uzay Bhemri has also written a preface yes. uh, to this. And then Borges, S.M. Borges, uh, uh, Professor, he has written uh, uh, two essays on this, in this uh, book. So, while translating this text, is there any particular translation strategy or method that you followed uh, while translating Krishna Purana into Konkani? What was it you were looking for? Were you looking for linguistic equivalence or were you uh, trying to preserve the poetic rhythm? Uh, what 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 was your approach towards yeah. translation? You know person? what happens with uh, Marathi and Kokni are very close. Mm. Translating into a foreign language is difficult, but Marathi and Kokni are almost very close languages, and so there was no great difficulty. Mm. So uh, I, my main uh, emphasis was <coughs> was on the fact that it had to be faithful, yes. and at the same time. I wanted it to be perfect. Okay. Most of the texts that you have translated are religious texts, yeah. scriptures. Yeah. Is there any specific reason for that or did it just happen? No, uh, well, uh, it just, the uh, Dhammapada, it just happened. But then I said, uh, language, uh, Kokni is a young literary language, though it's a great past, it's older than Marathi, yes. but we, because we didn't have political uh, independence Kokni people did not rule any part of this country. The Marathi were the rulers. Kokni were always subjects. So we were not able to cultivate uh, the language for literary and political purposes. Uh, so I felt that uh, Kokni had to be strengthened. And the best text were religious texts. And that's why I uh, bought the uh, translator the best that was available. So. Uh, Naneshwari is the uh, text in Marathi. Mm. It's a uh, commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. I did Bhagavad Gita itself. Dhammapad is this Tirukkural is quoted by everybody. All the finance ministers, will, if they are Tamilians, they will quote uh, Tirukkural. from Tiruk, uh, Tirukkural. Mm. So it happened. Mm. And then I wanted to uh, strengthen it with uh, Shakespeare. Yes. So I, I brought in Julius Caesar. What do you think is the necessity of translating texts from an older age, from say medieval Marathi to modern times? Uh, who reads it? Or is why is it important that we should translate texts from uh, say 17th century, such as the Christopher, or older 13th century, such as yeah. Nyaneshwari? Yeah, and bring it into today's times, especially texts with religious significance. Uh, as an educationist, as a translator, what do you think is the necessity of this? You know, uh, religious texts by and large give a spiritual messages. And they are universal in their uh, appeal. So it doesn't matter uh, which religion, because uh, <clears throat> if you are fanatical about your own religion, of course, you can't do these things. So a lot of people are surprised that uh, I translate a Sikh, Sikh scripture and I translate a uh, Christian scripture and a Buddhist scripture. So uh, one priest uh, who wrote a, a preface to my uh, um, gospel account to John said that Amonka first uh, leaves the religion and then only translates. And exactly, that's precisely what I do. Yes. Unless you are 
thoroughly identified with the content. That's one aspect. But uh, that's our tradition. Our uh, cultures and our, uh, our uh, languages develop. And uh, unless we know, uh, know how they have developed, how the vocabulary has been formed, and how it changes from uh, centuries to, se to another century, or, uh, that is uh, important for the students of languages and history and religion. So that's why we cannot cut ourselves off from the past. We live on the uh, strong, uh, groundwork, uh, uh, the foundational work of the past, and we can only build huge superstructures in the present day on those foundations. Do you think that a translation of a work, or, or do you think that translation is one way of strengthening a language? Absolutely, I tell you, the Portuguese in the 18th century were a backward, uh, having a backward literature in Europe. For almost a couple of centuries they did nothing but translation. And in 1900 and in 2006, their Saramago became a Nobel Prize winner. So you can imagine, a country we did hardly had any literature to talk about, talk of, they had one uh, Lusiad done by Camoys, mm -hmm. and that was the end of it. They didn't pursue literature, uh, they were not as famous as the English literature or uh, German literature. Mm -hmm. They didn't have great philosophers and writers like Kant uh, or like uh, Shakespeare. But after uh, translation work of stretching over a couple of centuries, they could produce a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, so this text has had quite a journey in Goa. Yeah. So it was printed, we lost the printed copies, then we had the handwritten manuscripts, Saldana took up those uh, yeah. handwritten but, manuscripts. Uh, but I'll just like to, you know, put in my word here. We lost the copies, printed copies. Were they lost or were they destroyed by the Portuguese? You have done after your retirement. Uh, as much as, as much work or more work than a person would do in an entire lifetime. So you've said it's your calling and God had a plan for you and destiny. Uh, but for the younger generation or maybe a young and budding translator like me, uh, what is your secret? How do you achieve that concentration? You know, seven days a week, uh, you sit for six or seven hours a day. So how? Where does that concentration come from? On a lighter note, if you could tell us how that happens. Well, I think, you know, it all happens. Is it discipline? Or it, it, I won't uh, put it the discipline all aspect. I think it happens because you are chosen to do your work. Finished. Otherwise, it would happen. Okay. You are chosen to do uh, some work. The brother is chosen to do his work. So, it happens. Okay. So if you're called to do it, then you will be able to do it. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank it's been you. It, it, nice it, talking to you. Yes. Thank you for yeah. sharing your knowledge with us.